All right, hey everybody, my name is Ben Horsley. I'm with Granite School District. I'm here with Steve Hogan, who's our Director of Planning and Boundaries. On October 3rd, we presented some information to the board as a follow-up from some of our discussions that we've been having with the community about the proposed Western Hills Elementary School closure. We wanted to then uh, kind of summarize that information for you and share that with you in a video. Um, we're not gonna go through all the slides as part of that presentation. You can always go to graniteschools.org, view the full presenta uh, presentation materials and all the materials that we have uh, been reviewing, all the numbers and data, comments that we've received with respect to this particular study and proposal. Again, www.graniteschools.org. Again, this is uh, to help understand the Population Analysis Committee's recommendation to the Board of Education. The final uh, recommendation will come in advance of the November uh, board meeting and the board will vote two different times both in November and December and those dates have already been shared with the general community. So with respect to that, uh, we're going to do a quick recap, uh, go through the study process and the, the benefits and the why of consolidation and we're going to specifically speak about this Western Hills Elementary proposal. So I'll jump in here, Ben. So let's talk about the why. Why are we even studying this? You can see uh, Granite school, school District, we believe that optimizing elementary school size creates better outcomes and opportunities for students. We've known this for years and we've talked about it quite a bit in this study. We know that schools, elementaries especially, can be too small and too large. In this case, a lot of our elementaries are in fact too small. And I want to talk quickly about what that means and what that looks like with some of the benefits of consolidation. Okay, so we see here, I won't go over all of these, like Ben mentioned, these slides are on the website, but you can see include, but aren't limited to just these. There are a lot of benefits, but again, having an average school size of about 500 to 550 gives us that kind of sweet spot where we have enough teachers and resources and the full benefits for all students from no split grade level classrooms, more parental choice, professional learning opportunities, team teaching, balancing out classroom size, and on the next slide, uh, simply an, an economy of scale. We also see and have concerns in the past, and we know that when we have this right sizing, if you will, that our, our PTAs and school community councils, teacher committees, uh, there's less burnout and more participation, just more people to choose from and have the opportunity to help at the school. I would point out as part of that, as, as we've done this study, it's come to our attention that the PTAs at both of these respective schools are about 60, 60 parents. What would that be like if we actually combined the two school populations, got in that 500 uh, student population range, we'd have over 100 volunteers in our PTA just alone for that one school location. How great would that be? What this means, and I'm sure many of you watching this have experienced this, and that is our school community councils and PTAs especially, and other parent volunteers, are the same people are doing the same thing. You're likely on the PTA, the school community council, fundraising, and all the other committees, the same few people are doing those. We would love to be able to get more parents to help and to be more resources for the students. So now let's jump straight into the map. Of course, many of you have seen this map, and this is the proposed closure of Western Hills. Like Ben mentioned earlier, nothing is done yet. Uh, the board still has to have a, an initial approval in November, and then a potentially final approval in December. But this is the proposal. This is the Western Hills boundary here, and kind of the salmon color and stripe. The proposal is to have all of the Western Hills students come over to Silver Hills and join part of the Silver Hills uh, join the Silver Hills community. Part of Silver Hills and this area here would then feed in to become part of Beehive Elementary. One thing to keep in mind with this is all of the secondary feeder patterns remain the same. So the current Western Hills students that feed into Kearns Jr. will remain. Um, they will continue to feed into Kearns Jr. and Kearns High. These students um, in Silver Hills will continue to go to Kennedy Junior and so on. These students will continue to go to Jefferson Junior. 
So one of the things that we've seen um, in terms of as we've gone out to the community, some of the questions we're hearing about it uh, have to do with facility. And a lot of times people look at the age of the building and say, well, that's when a building should be rebuilt or uh, that should be a determining factor. Less so for the year built is what this FCI score is. And that's a, called a facility condition index. And uh, this, we have rank ordered our facility condition index. This isn't their actual score. This is where they're at on essentially a rebuild list. So the actual smaller the number, um, the worse the condition of the school. And so our higher number facilities are actually our, our better facilities. We have 60 some odd elementary schools. So 46 is actually, even though it was a, a, a built a year later, is actually a better condition than even Silver Hills. And Silver Hills is much better condition than um, Western Hills in and of itself. We've also outlined on this chart, as we were analyzing this as a population analysis committee, some of the special programs. Um, we have uh, some of our special special education programs that are currently housed at Silver Hills and Beehive. Those are district level programs that could potentially move as a result of, of these boundary changes and potential consolidations. And then we show the overall enrollment counts and what we project those enrollments would be um, if this proposal were to be adopted by the Board of Education. So uh, the net impact here is what we do see a number of routes currently coming from uh, that peanut area that would go to Beehive. That would be one less bus route and potentially actually a few more less buses as we look at some potential changes to special education and where some of those programs are housed. So uh, we wanted to kind of show this chart. We're going to talk about this facility condition a little bit more and what that means and why it's important um, as part of our consideration as a population analysis committee. Uh, patrons have asked about Title I. Western Hills is currently a Title I school. Would Silver Hills, if this proposal goes through and uh, those enrollments or boundaries are joined, would Silver Hills automatically become a Title I school? We currently do have uh, approval and permission from the state to do that. That's uh, a little out of the ordinary where in the years past we've had to wait a year or two to make that Title I status official and receive full funding and resources. However, in this case, given the school consolidation, the state has initially approved that uh, Silver Hills would be Title I from day one. What's important to also understand too is that Beehive is not currently Title I and this would not impact any status of that particular school location with this boundary adjustment. This, uh, we, we actually went and we wanted to share a couple of photos with the Board of Education as we've been analyzing the facility and want to welcome students into the, the best environment possible. And it's really actually quite critical how, the how much of an impact the facility has on our students' ability to learn and the instructional quality. Uh, this is uh, Western Hills Library. As you can see, it's a building. It was, it's a beautiful building, but it was built in 1962. And uh, things are a little bit more cramped. It's not as large. It's actually about the size of a regular classroom, about 900 square feet. Um, this is a picture of Silver Hills. Uh, library, one of the most beautiful library facilities actually in probably all of our elementary schools in the entire district. Um, it's large, it's spacious, it's probably the size of four classrooms and so plenty of room in that uh, particular facility. Here's some other shots of what that looks like um, in that particular uh, building. Did you want to add anything? Sure. A lot of people have asked simply about uh, the building itself. The reason we show that is it's not just about the number of classrooms in a building, Ben, and we, we talk about this often in the communities, but our large um, spaces, our shared spaces, whether that's in the hallways, even the restrooms sometimes, uh, but in this case we chose to highlight the media center and there's a significant difference there. So I think it's important just to, uh, of note. Yeah, and I think it's just one example of actually a few that we could share. And that's not a denigration of Western Hills. Western not Hills is a beautiful building, but again, it was built in 1962, which goes to the next slide, uh, talking about a few key f factors within that building that make it a challenge moving forward. So if we go back and think about that FCI, in a nutshell, we're looking at two key things that, are, that really make the difference, not just the age of the building, but you can see at the top, air quality. Significantly better indoor air quality at Silver Hills based upon newer and more efficient HVAC system. So that's just, again, indoor air quality, more air exchanges. The students, or the, the, the air the students are breathing for that seven or eight hours a day is simply better, but again, 
That's a function of a newer building and a more efficient system. And this is still true despite the fact that we know it is closer, like some people have pointed out, to some of the industry and the corridor and some of the other concerns that community had about being closer to industry. Yet it is still a better system and, and has better air quality inside the building there. And secondly, uh, seismic concerns. Higher probability of structural failure at Western Hills in the event of a major seismic event. Yep. So this slide uh, presents some information that's technical in nature, but it comes from FEMA, which is the Federal Emergency Management Association uh, Agency. In this case, it's a rapid visual screening results, and it gives a score of one and a half for Silver Hills and 0.3 for Western Hills. The higher the score, the better the structural uh, condition of the facility. What the score essentially tells us from this independent agency that in the, the event of a major seismic event, uh, we're going to actually be able to continue to probably use Silver Hills where Western Hills may not last that, uh, that, that uh, event. And so as we think about unreinforced masonry buildings, Granite School District, one of the oldest school districts in the state of Utah, we have some of the oldest buildings on average uh, currently in use in the state and we it's a billion dollar problem and we're trying to rebuild as many schools as we possibly can as fast as we possibly can but resources are finite those resources come from our taxpayers and so we're sensitive to the fact that uh, while Western Hills is a beautiful building it's been well taken care of it has essentially outlived its life cycle and we're concerned if there were a major seismic event that that building would not survive uh, that event. Yeah. This next slide kind of goes through a little bit of history of when this boundary came to pass. When we were uh, visiting with your community in the open house, a lot of people felt like um, that the boundary had been created to basically condemn Western Hills to a decline in population and that they would never be able to outgrow that. Uh, this shows uh, an actual historic boundary from back in uh, when Silver Hills uh, and Diamond Ridge was opened down here a little bit further um, when that boundary uh, goes back almost uh, 20 some odd years. And so uh, when that uh, boundary was created, it was actually when Silver Hills was opened in 1985. Now let's show you what the, some of those numbers look like uh, back in 1985. You can't see this chart in detail, but we'll see uh, back in the, the 80s and this, well, let's go back as far as the 70s. In, in the 70s, the average population at Western Hills was 658 kids. That rose in the 80s with most of our schools to 887 which necessitated the, re, uh, the building of additional schools in the area, like Silver Hills. And when Silver Hills was opened in, in uh, 1985, that reduced both populations uh, to the 600 range. Both of those schools stayed in that 500, 600 range. Silver Hills got as high as 900 at one point before Diamond Ridge was opened in 2009. Since that time, the boundary has not changed at all in this whole time period, but the population has continued to decline in both schools to being where we're at today, approximately 270 in both locations. And what this tells us is that the boundary, we weren't, we weren't, uh, the school district 20 years, some odd years ago, didn't design or intentionally uh, create a declining population in Western Hills. When that boundary was created, Western Hills was at capacity and actually uh, past capacity and we needed more schools in the area to help offset that population uh, but what it does show us is what we're seeing across the district is declining birth populations declining birth rates and a decline in our overall uh, student population one of the advantages however of this uh, boundary proposal is the fact that there is a pedestrian bridge as you're aware from living in this area that uh, as you can see from the pictures here there's a pedestrian bridge over the top of 5600 west we have watched this ben and i in fact have gone out several mornings and afternoons and and watched the the flow of traffic of students and parents using that bridge so i want to talk a little more about this bridge and what it really means um, despite some of the concerns we've heard out there and talking to crossing guards and our observations and other people the good news is um, that we have not had uh, especially in the last five or six years from everything we can see any concerns about students trying to cross 5600 west uh, the crossing guard in particular has told us that uh, all students and or parents use the bridge when the crossing guard is there and um, i want to just uh, i think what's really important that we want to emphasize here is we we're sensitive we're both parents here we're sensitive to the fact that more so than ever 
uh, and may be difficult for parents to choose to allow their children to walk to school. But it is, in fact, statistically speaking, a, a very safe activity. Now, there are different ways to offset and make sure that remains a safe activity, walking in large groups, et cetera. Uh, but this walking bridge was a key factor in uh, the Population Analysis Committee's recommendation. And in fact, I, if this walking bridge were not in place, I don't feel like the Population Analysis Committee would have made this recommendation. We do feel like it's safe. And in my 15 years with Granite School District, I'm aware of many incidents across the district where we've had students hit um, or injured or even, unfortunately, in a few circumstances, even killed. None of those have occurred in this particular area. So drawing upon historical data, this appears to be a very, very safe um, route. We have, as you're aware, the boundaries we just showed you on that map has been in place uh, since 1985. And so we've been drawing students from the east side of 5600 West to the west side using this bridge. And uh, we have not been able to find any records of accidents, injuries, or fatalities um, in this particular instance. So uh, we did discuss the potential in the board meeting of uh, could the city add some fence or do some other things. We'll certainly have those, if this decision is rendered and this proposal accepted, we'll certainly have those conversations with the city to see if there's ways that we can enhance the safety of this crossing. Uh, but at this, at this current time, it appears to be a very, very safe um, alternative. We do know that average student walking time would still be about 10 to 15 minutes and that the vast majority of the walking route uh, is uh, in neighborhood streets, on residential streets, which is good news. And historically and recently observations, again, like we mentioned, indicate proactive student use of the bridge. And finally, just for some additional context, sometimes it feels like perhaps um, your students would be the only ones that have to get even close to 5600 West or even use a pedestrian bridge. So for context all over the district, there are 57 elementary schools, all 57 have this 1.5 mile walking area that is simply state standard. Granite School District currently has 19 schools that are all walking, which this one would become if the proposal went through. Granite has, the community has 11 other pedestrian bridges which serve 27 schools. So in fact, this is a, 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 almost a golden opportunity to make a change. We rarely get this opportunity to make a change like this and have the pedestrian bridge be part of the safe walking route. I th what, what I think you're trying to point out here is that we see this walking bridge as a, a tremendous advantage to Western Hill students and to Silver Hill students and we want to make sure that we take advantage of ensuring there's a safe way for our kids to cross. Rarely do we see a circumstance when we're looking right. at these boundary adjustments where the uh, that type of infrastructure, in this case a bridge, is already in place. Finally, I think this is a key stat just for some context around our district and in fact most other districts around Utah and that is 90 percent of all Granite School District elementary students live in a designated walking area and only 10 percent are eligible for busing. That of course doesn't mean that 90 percent of students walk but they do live within that walking area. Parents of course can and do choose to uh, drive their students to, to school, to and from school oftentimes, but this isn't out of the ordinary. In fact, it's, it's more common. It's not 90 percent, again, of the students live within that 1.5 mile range of a school. We just want to uh, thank you uh, for participating in all this, uh, these meetings that we've held, the open houses. We've been to school community councils. We have additional meetings with city officials um, that before we make a final recommendation. Again, this isn't Steve and I's decision. We work together with the community. We try to understand the needs and the concerns of communities, bring that back to the Population Analysis Committee as we evaluate data. And remember that our goal is probably the same as your goals, even though we're, we might get there in a different way. And we want students to have success. We want students to be in an environment, uh, a quality facility with great teachers, um, with lots of opportunities and experiences. Um, our goal is to make sure that kids have access to, to academic opportunities that are incredible. Um, they can grow and be part of uh, the Granite tradition. And so we're making recommendations based on, on that philosophy and that approach. Um, we know that this is tough. Um, we know this is challenging. We are so appreciative that you would take the time to provide your feedback to us. 
Um, and I want you to know how seriously the Population Analysis Committee evaluates all that information. And as we kind of work towards making these recommendations, um, no decision has been made. That decision will not be made until the November uh, board meeting. And again, you do have the opportunity to come and provide comment at the public hearing at the board meeting that evening. Did I miss thank you, meeting? Ben. And I would just add, thank you, patrons. Again, these are very, very difficult decisions. As uh, the Population Analysis Committee, again, we make recommendations to the board. The board has very, very difficult decision to make regarding this. Uh, but in the end, I can tell you, through my experience of the last 10 years, is the board is most concerned about your children and uh, their education, and they will make the best decision for their welfare and education. So thank you. We look forward to your feedback. We appreciate your time and look forward to seeing you out in the community again soon.